funny how things change over a short period of time, right? The Baylor Bears used to be that football team that when you saw them on the schedule, you were like, yeah, automatic W, okay? Just chuck one up in the win column. It's like a bye week, okay? Put our second and third stringers in, no big deal. Now, when you play Baylor, you know you got to play your A game, and your thought process might be something to the effect of, man, I hope they don't score at least a half a hundred on us. <laughs> yeah, our brows made that big of a difference in the past few years with Baylor football, and they show no signs of slowing down. With nearly everybody back from a team that a year ago went 11-2, and in fact, the proof's in the pudding that Browse is one of the best coaches in college football, and of course responsible for a major turnaround in the city of Waco. You know, 30 wins in the past three seasons. You would have been laughed at in that area you know, a while back if you would have told anybody that this team was going to win back-to-back -back conference championships. They would have tested you for narcotics. But you look at what they've done in the last three years. Like I said, 30 victories and 22 wins over the back-to-back -back Big 12 championships last year, splitting the uh, Big 12 title with TCU, a team that they beat head-to-head. -head. Only a West Virginia loss prevented Baylor, in my opinion, from getting into that four-team college football playoff. And even though, you know, Baylor's season ended on a sour note with a uh, loss to Michigan State in which the Spartans came back from a huge fourth-quarter deficit, it still could not damper the fact that Baylor, again, had tons of success. 11-2 and two, and 17 of 22 starters back from a year ago. So Baylor football appears ready to stay, even though they have to replace their best offensive player from a year ago. And that was, of course, a quarterback Bryce Petty. Now you have Seth Russell, who did see a little playing time a year ago. Not much, but some. So he did get his feet wet. And a year ago, got eight TDs and just, you know, one interception and threw for a little over 800 yards. But remember, he didn't play a whole heck of a lot. So maybe his completion percentage of 56%, you know, maybe dogging that may not be fair to the guy. But now it's Russell's show and it's his job to lose. And he has an opportunity to do what other Baylor quarterbacks under Browse have done in the past, you know, with Petty, the great success he had, Nick Florence, the one year that he was a starter, and, of course, Robert Griffin III, you know, we know what he did a few years ago, winning a Heisman Trophy. And we never thought that would happen, you know, in our lifetime at Baylor, and now they're producing terrific quarterbacks, and, of course, winning a lot more than losing. The backfield, you can't ignore. Shock, Limwood, just a junior, and, you know, as a sophomore, the guy was explosive. A little over 1,200 yards rushing, 5 yards per carry to go along with a whopping 16 touchdowns. And if you think that's something, his backup can play too. And Johnny Jefferson, whom as a freshman, scored 6 times and had a little over 500 yards. So expect his playing time to increase as well. The receiving core, other than Antoine Goodley, uh, they return everybody, okay? Goodley was a valuable part of that team, but, you know, Corey Coleman and KD Cannon are more than capable of picking up from where they left off, making Baylor dangerous as far as throwing the ball as well. Now, Coleman a year ago, a little over 1,100 yards receiving, 64 grabs, and 58 grabs and a little over 1,000 yards for KD Cannon. That's right, you return couple of thousand yard receivers from the year before and the leadership of Jay Lee a senior uh, with 42 grabs and a little over 650 yards so receiving weapons oh yeah they got them at the tight end position we thought that Jordan Feuerbacher was going to redshirt but the sophomore it looks like he's going to play because we see him number one on the tight end depth chart the offensive line extremely experienced for Baylor led by the all-american Spencer Drango Left tackle, a little surprised he came back for a senior year, but obviously the goal, try to close out your year with a national championship, and Drango, his appearance alone gives Baylor that opportunity. Left guard position, you know, Desmond Hilliard, also a senior, 18 starts, by the way, Drango, 35 starts in his career. And at the center position, one of the few underclassmen you'll see starting on the offensive side for Baylor, and that is uh, Kyle Fuller. Right guard position, you have Jarrell Broxton, a senior, and riding out the lineup at right tackle, a senior in Pat Colbert. Uh, this is a team, despite the fact there's no more Troy Baker at right tackle, they return everybody else, and uh, they should have some backups also in there who've seen some you know, time as far as playing, not necessarily starts, but playing time. So they're going to be able to go plenty too deep on that offensive line, and whether they run or whether they throw, um, it's going to be successful either way because the offensive line against one of the best in college football. Now, defensively, Baylor did give up their share of big yardage and also points, but they also forced turnovers, too. That D uh, was seventh in the country when it came to turnover margin, whether it was interceptions or fumbles forced and recovered. You know, Baylor was an opportunistic team because they made opportunities occur. Sean Oakman, you know, this guy's got All-American written all over his name, entering his senior year, 44 tackles a year ago for the senior and 11 quarterback sacks on one side. 
and complimenting him. On the other side is Jamal Parker. Um, you know, he has plenty of leadership as well. Two and a half sacks a year ago and uh, 10 tackles. Um, so you got a couple of experienced ends. Uh, Bo Blackshear, um, you'll have him at defensive tackle. 35 stops a year ago, four and a half sacks. And at nose tackle, Andrew Billings, Jr. with 13 stops. And rounding it out, too, um, expect K.J. Smith to be a part of that defensive end rotation. Just a sophomore now, but last season as a freshman, made an impact with 36 tackles and five sacks. So, big new thing or two about getting to the quarterback and creating pressure, which means you can also create opportunities. So, no wonder they were number seven in the nation when it came to the takeaway margin. That helps. Also helps, too, that you have back, um, you know, Taylor Young, a weak side linebacker, 74 stops a year ago and four quarterback sacks. And another weak side linebacker um, with Albanian Edwards, you have him and the middle linebacker, too, and Raekwon Davis and Grant Campbell, they'll rotate as well. Linebackers should be pretty good, but, of course, we know that Bryce Hager was the leader of the team, the All-American linebacker. You know, he's moved on now. But still, they have enough quality at linebacker to keep it going. And, by the way, the secondary returns everybody but one. They lose Colin uh, Brents, but everybody else is back, including Trayvon Howard. You'll see at the nickelback spot, um, Orion Stewart, four interceptions a year ago. You also have Zamian Howard, who had four picks, too. Again, this, the opportunities we're talking about, the interceptions that Baylor had a year ago, and you get a lot of this experience back. Um, Terrell Burt and Ryan Reed uh, running it out from the corner safety spots. So Baylor, extremely experienced up front, secondary. And other than, you know, Hager, you get um, everybody else back at the linebacking spot. This is a big reason why I lean toward Baylor over TCU in the um, – Big 12, even though I know their head-to-head matchup this year will be at Fort Worth, Baylor simply has almost everybody back on the defensive side. Not that they won't miss Hager, but they have enough quality on that defensive side and experience to where now I think they'll play even better. As far as the place kicking goes, um, Chris Callahan definitely needs to step it up a little bit. 18 of 26 a year ago, that may not sound bad, but he was only 2 of 6 from field goals of 40 yards or longer. That trend can't continue, and they will have a new uh, punter now that Spencer Roth has moved on. The schedule for the Baylor Bears. Last year, they got ripped nationally for playing cupcakes, and the same thing's probably going to happen this time around. Coincidentally, their first game is coming up, um, you know, in my time since I'm doing this on the early Friday morning. You know, coincidentally, they're playing on September 4th, on Friday evening, as they will play in Dallas against SMU. Eight days later, they'll play Lamar at home, and then they get a bye week for Rice. SMU, Lamar, and Rice. Not exactly something that's going to impress the committee, but if Baylor can run the table and go undefeated, um, I think they'll have to uh, with that non-conference schedule, then it won't matter in the end. I think 12-0 will get them a college football playoff bid. But with that non-conference schedule, as weak as it is, um, they can't lose a game anywhere on that schedule because the committee will look back at who they played non-conference-wise, and yeah, they might have gone 3-0 and in the month of September, but you should when you play Rice, Lamar, and SMU. Nothing against those schools, but, I mean, come on, really? Come on, Baylor. Anyway, let's take a look at early October. Big 12 play, Texas Tech, you get them in Arlington. Remember a year ago, you know, Baylor got that big lead, looked like the game was over. Tech came roaring back and made it very, very interesting. The teams combined for over 90 points that day in Arlington. The rematch, same spot, Jerry Stadium on October 3rd. Following week, you go to Kansas. And then the week after that, October 17th, you know Baylor's got this game circled, and they have since the offseason. West Virginia, the Mountaineers last year in Morgantown, pulled up one of the big upsets of the year. The game that costed Baylor, you can easily say, a shot at the college football playoff. That was Baylor's only uh, regular season blemish on that 12-game schedule. But the rematch this time is in Waco. October 24th, Iowa State, they come to Waco. And then you get a bye week. November 5th, you go to Kansas State. The Little Apple, Manhattan, on a Thursday night in front of a national audience. That's going to be a tricky game. And then um, more difficult games um, awaiting uh, Baylor. And then you got to um, to deal with the likes of OU November 14th. And then back-to-back road games. And November 21st, I know people are going to be thinking about November 27th and the game against TCU. I'm telling you right now, Baylor is going to get just as much of a challenge from Oklahoma State on November 21st as they will from the guys from Fort Worth in Fort Worth as TCU on the 27th on a Friday. 
That November 21st game in Stillwater is dicey at the minimum for Baylor. And they have not had a lot of success in Stillwater anyway. So, you got to watch out for Rudolph and company from Stillwater. Baylor, that's one of those sandwich games. you got to be very tricky. Uh, it could be very tricky for Baylor if they're not careful. And, of course, December 27th on a Friday day after Turkey Day at Fort Worth against TCU, one of the most anticipated games of the year. A year ago, Baylor came from 21 back in the fourth quarter to win that game. And then you wrap up the year against a good Texas defense with offensively um, a lot of question marks, and you get them in Waco. So that helps for that um, you know, that Saturday game of December. And, of course, the next day, that's when the college football playoff will announce their four teams that will go. Baylor, I think they're going to run the table. I think the game against you know Oklahoma State and TCU right now look to be the two most difficult but they have more experience back than anybody else. They're well coached under Art Bryles. And as we've seen the last few years, they know how to win. So I'm going to say Baylor runs the table. They go 12 0. They get to the college football playoff, but I think they lose to Auburn in the semifinals. That's my look at Baylor. Again, I have Baylor winning another Big 12 championship, but falling in the Final Four. Thanks for watching.